All right, welcome everyone to the deep learning for single cell mapping breakout session. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us at the, at the end of the day. Uh, my name is Kieran Campbell. I'm an investigator here in Toronto. Um, I'll be co-leading this breakout session with, with Amin. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Amin Emart from McGill University and Mila. Uh, and this is actually my first uh, HCA meeting. And I'm very excited to come here and uh, lead this session uh, today. Great. Um, so we have to remind you that this is being broadcast. Uh, and so if you're in the room, you apparently consent to, to being broadcast. Um, so we've really tried to organize this as more of a discussion than a presentation. Um, so hopefully we get some good discussion, not just a sort of a question and answer session. Uh, we've put together six, six questions to sort of uh, coalesce around, try to sort of uh, stimulate some discussion. And really around the, the role of, of deep learning um, for, for single cell mapping. Uh, we have sort of expanded on each of these questions in the subsequent slides um, that we can go through. Um, but we're also super happy to have sort of more open discussion if there's burning questions or things people want to discuss as well. Um, yeah, we, we didn't really plan to give a large introduction to deep learning for single cell mapping because a lot of this conference so far has been uh, around deep learning. Uh, there was a fantastic breakout session this morning um, in, for foundation models, which is of course largely driven by um, by deep learning. So I'll just I'll just quickly go through these questions and we'll jump into the first one. Um, we really hope this can be interactive. If people have thoughts and ideas they'd like to share, um, there are notes being taken uh, that will be distilled into sort of a set of recommendations or or, or challenges for deep learning in the future. Um, so Amin and myself sort of got together and, and came up with these six questions. Uh, that we think are kind of interesting in terms of the future of deep learning. Um, so the first is, you know, what role does machine learning and, and deep learning play in terms of detecting and correcting label quality, right? Because a lot of the time, deep learning single cell, uh, we obviously need label data, um, and the labels can be of variable quality. Um, the second question we have is around domain shift. So what happens when uh, the, the distribution of the data changes between your training and your test deployment setting? Um, there's interesting questions around annotation granularity. This has come up several times in talks already. So what is the optimal granularity of, of where you want to define a cell type as a label? Um, and crucially, are there deep learning or, or really any machine learning methods that can actually help us establish the level of granularity we'd like to work at? Um, we've also thought about overfitting. So are there tools or approaches that can help guard against overfitting when we have deep learning for, for cell annotation and cell mapping. Um, so the first four are really thinking about supervised approaches um, and then sort of two perhaps more open-ended questions. We think about unsupervised models. A lot of single cell machine learning is, is unsupervised um, and it's notoriously hard to benchmark and evaluate and quantify the performance of these models because we lack a lot of ground truth. Um, so how do we measure performance and is there a role for new methods in terms of actually evaluating this? Um, and finally, we have a question about uh, simulators. So what role do simulators play um, and what shortcomings um, exist to address these? Um, so we'll go through these one by one, but if anyone else has comments or questions, um, feel, free to, feel free to jump out. Um, we've been told that there's microphones in the room, so you shouldn't have to have a microphone in your hand, although if you're in the foundation model breakout session, this morning, that didn't go so well, um, but please, please feel free to put your hand up um, and, and just shout out with ideas. Um, so the first, uh, the first question or sort of thought we had was about label quality, right? So for single cell mapping uh, using deep learning, we often need ground truth labels of some form. Um, but as we know, this annotation can be inconsistent or wrong or conflicting. Um, and so our first thought is, you know, what's the role of machine learning or deep learning um, in terms of correcting this, this mislabel quality um, or, um, you know, correction or detection? Um, happy to take any thoughts from the audience or we can, we can muse as well. Yes. Let's see the microphone anyways, just in case. Just in case, backup microphone. <coughs> yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Chernevsky. Um, I work for, for Deep Life. Um, so in terms of label quality, that, that can be defined in many different ways. Um, one is uh, ontologies, as how you actually define things and categories. And the second thing is that um, 
cells cannot actually be classified in uh, as labels uh, if you think about the the true biology because they are always uh, defined in a continuum so what do you think if we change the the way classification is done rather than by categories by uh, actually a measure of uh, cell let's say probability within this multidimensional space so yeah so it's just like changing now the the categories for example blood is a kind of very easy task to to classify but if you have development you never have like these uh chunks so labels are kind of meaningless in the in this context and as we approach more uh, atlas level data that is kind of like the the true biology that you would see yeah no, that's that's an excellent question and fine actually so i guess to to muse on two points of that the first is do you think new data structures are needed to store that and those annotations because it's no longer a sort of trivial vector of uh of, you know, at classes as you go along. And the second is, do you foresee a sort of strategy for labeling that? Because it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to manually label cell types and classes as we know, and it's, it's just as hard to label trajectories and especially if you have like complicated bifurcating uh, things. Gary. I just want to mention that um, we don't know how to model biology fully, right? So we'll never, you know, until we know how to fully understand biology, which might you know, take quite a while. We, we're never going to be able to label in the way that we could ideally label, right? And we, we won't even know the right paradigm. But um, so there's sort of different levels, right? Like if we're if we if we're choosing a classification, a cell type classification task, we should be aware that it's never going to be. It's just going to have a, a limit of precision that won't be possible to pass through until we have better representation schemes, for instance, to capture additional structure. But so. As, as long as people like us are aware of that, then it's, you know, you can work within that boundary. But, um, you know, then within that boundary, there might be, you know, these questions might be a bit more relevant. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think basically the idea is that, again, goes back to one of the questions about different granularities that uh, kind of fits nicely here, because uh, I guess part of the comment there was that we may not even be able to define that labels, but as you pointed out, I guess maybe there are at least some level of uh, labels that we can define. Um, did you want to go to Philip over there? I'm, I'm unclear. <laughs> so, I mean, so John Dick was challenged on this on this question yesterday because he was, uh, he was using very discretized um, a state, making discretized statements about what, how he classified cell types. So, and he, and and yet, you know, we've heard a couple of points already, both I think Gary and but have made the claim that that that's perhaps particularly well, I think your point was also depending on the developmental stage that you're looking at the material, it's going to be very different than what so I think that's an excellent point as well, just re-emphasizing that it, if you're looking at something that's much more extant versus something in terms of a developmental process, these those are going to have different types of not just labels, but how we define a label or a species of cell type. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great point. It'd be interesting to think as well, the extent to which a combination of labels and, and sort of more continuous values are needed. Because I think, I think we all often recognize as a continuum, but you know, this sort of discrete bucketing is such a useful mental model as well as it is for pure classification performance. It is interesting to think about the, the need for both of them. Yeah, actually, I also agree with what, um, or what kind of build up on what you said just now. Also, um, so like um, having, some kind of discretization, of course, it's not. Um, you kind of lose a bit of resolution of the biology and so on. You lose also some information, but you still have some like very valuable information that you can still make use of. And I think, um, especially when we're thinking of scaling up in terms of data and so, um, and also maybe speeding up um, certain notation processes, right, which are very manage uh, more manageable on smaller data sets, but might get a little bit more difficult on larger data sets. I think there's a lot of value in having. Right, references that you could uh, map to, like um, and a representation of kind of knowledge that we can transfer. Um, so I think that that is still a useful thing, but can of course still be improved. And I guess that's also kind of the idea behind the whole reference atlasing thing. Although it is a bit difficult to say, like, where do we kind of, how big do we decide our scope is, and to what degree, like, which system do we select, where we know that. Um, we um, mapping actually works or even makes sense. That's probably the challenge there. 
Yeah. I think that on a related uh, note also, I wanted to kind of ask, uh, how should we uh, define these kind of transitional states or cells that are not very really clearly discrete? If whether, for example, kind of marker approach is a good approach or deep learning, for example, going back to the question, can have a role in kind of better defining them, whether that's something that uh, the audience Sometimes people you try also try to use gene sets, not not individual gene, kind of so obtain the some reference data from Barrex RNC or something, and then makes some reference gene set for individual cell type and then perform some enrichment analysis and according to that enrichment level, the people try to define so some perform some cell type classification or decide to apply us to the level. Or the each cell type. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking, you know, based off of all this conversation, uh, sort of starting over because it seems like with every new technology with a microscope, there's the first kind of more rudimentary cell type definitions, and you have like flow cytometry kind of stuff where you have these cell surface markers as uh, more precise definitions. Now it's just like another kind of microscope where we now have even more higher resolution. So we can just come up with mappings that are, you know, uh, uh, based on the previous cell types. But, you know, we say, oh, this has, you know, this percentage of a uh, shared state between this type and this type, and it's on this direction, this axis and you can map it like that right so you can use these methods um maybe not as a correction or a consensus but as a new definition of these kinds of cell types based off of prior uh annotations do, do you think cross modality sort of anchor data sets are important then i mean the, the famous example is cd4 t cells don't express much cd4 at the transcriptome level um, so you'd never, maybe never discover a CD4 T cell as a CD4 T cell if you didn't have the protein or the surface protein. Yeah. So do you think, I guess in, in this paradigm, you need good anchor data sets that cross modality so that you relate to previous and previous results, right? Yeah. It's gotta be something that I think is widely accessible to many people, right? And that's very easy so that anyone can have these step two definitions. And um, yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> High resolution, widely accessible until the next generation comes. Yeah. So I have a suggestion like completely define something from scratch, or would you go more with them, say, like more of an iterative approach, saying um, based on what we got from both before and then kind of building on that? It, you'd have to build on the prior, right? Because that's how you can have the different definitions between a pre pro, you know, B cell and a pro, et, et cetera, right? Like, that that's what people are familiar with and what they know, but we now know there are additional transition states in between each state uh, cell type. And so you can just- So you, you would add like a constant data and a set of markers or something? Because I think it's sometimes difficult if you have, especially once you start iterating multiple data sets as well, but um, it's say the- Um, so if, for example, for different samples or different um, data sets, certain expressions might not be exactly on the same scale, right? So it's a bit difficult if you're not actually working with comparable scales. You can always scale your data within its context. I guess that might be an option. But um, I think, uh, I don't know if there's a way to kind of come up with something similar to like a common coordinate fra framework in spatial, like if we could come up with something like that, that might be possibility to somehow define transition, transitional states mathematically. But I, I, I think it's kind of difficult to do that because you, if you don't really know what is like, what is your ground truth with your reference or the, the range of the values, it might be a bit tricky. I think it's an excellent point. I, I worry about that in terms of transition states as well. Like if your transition just looks like the average of your endpoints, but you change modality and you can rescale everything, it can be very hard to pick out unless you have a really good example of the endpoints in your data set to know what the average should look like. Great. Uh, should we move on to the next discussion yeah, part? Okay.
last right. comments about this before we move on? Maybe just a question. So okay. then, like, based on the, the things that we discussed, would it seem, sorry, would it then kind of seem feasible to say instead of, well, I guess there's a bit of discussion whether you want to focus on genes or not. But if you say, well, we can try to characterize cell types by their structure in, a, in an embedding, whether that would be something meaningful or by, or by closeness on something that a model kind of summarized rather than just the features? I guess my perspective about like using, for example, something like embedding um, is that assuming that embedding comes from you know, something like a deep learning model, again, goes back to what type of model we are using and how it's been trained and whether the embeddings are going to actually put the cell types that are from the same type together or not. And if you have a different model, it may change. So again, I think that is kind of goes back to whether how robust it is and how um, you know, different models kind of, what is the consensus among them? So again. So I, I have a curiosity about legal quality if, uh... Anyone has examples of really wrong labels, or because in my experience, when you try to integrate across data sets, the main problem that you have is that there's different levels of like um, granularity, essentially. So someone might have, yeah, annotated to uh, like a very, like maybe annotated uh, with a very general label, a very specific subtype that you have that someone else might have detected better. Or on the other hand, you have some overclustering problem, like you someone has annotated to essentially too much to it found like a subset that maybe and but that type of scenario you can sort of tell based on like do you find it across replicates uh, is it like just a few samples or things like that so what other types of wrong labeling uh, essentially hint because this is what essentially this this difference in granularity can mess up if you're using clustering um you know, uh, metrics like random index to see, oh, you, you might call something like a bad clustering, but it, it's actually B cells and naive B cells or something like that. But what are other cases of really wrong labeling? And just, just really simply, right? Doing T cell with the dash and T cell without the dash. But, but, know, the, like but this is like, there's, we were discussing yesterday, there's methods to detect these type of like synonyms, for example. Um, so this, you, you know, um, but this is like I, I, this in my head is like not wrong annotation, but it's just like using a different name. I would say, like in my personal experience, it's usually like lack of ambient RNA or like lack of appropriate ambient RNA correction and over reliance on very small number of marker genes that are often the same. The other thing is that uh, even when we have clustering, for example, and then we're looking at the marker genes. How do you deal with it when you know, there's no con uh, consensus over these different markers and tell a different story each of them? Do you cons consider them as kind of you know, a sign of probability to that being a specific type, for example, at whatever granularity you're looking at? Or not? So on one hand, you want to use more markers. On the other hand, the more you use, the inconsistency among them becomes, again, a challenge that you have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, we, we have an example from my lab where a student was doing cell type mapping using one of the automatic tools that will remain nameless. And some of the cell types were just completely wrong. And we didn't realize until a collaborator came along and said, hey, I've looked at your, your cell types and this doesn't make any sense. Um, and, you know, you then use a different tool and they actually got it much more correct. So I think there's a role for consistency, as everybody knows, right? That if you have consistency amongst different tools, it's better. But I, I wasn't aware that they could actually be quite so wrong as they were until running that. So I think that's somewhat where this question comes from, right? Like it's, it can be very real that it's just completely wrong, but a lot of them lack confidence scores or sort of probabilities. So it's quite hard to detect up front um, unless you have someone check your data, which is always good to have. Sorry, Gary. And, and just a quick note, people may have seen the lung map paper that came out. There was a, there was a bunch of uh, inconsistent labels that were identified for manual labeling. So it's a good test. It's a good test set if anyone's interested in looking at inconsistent labels. Great, thanks. And also synonyms from 14 bit sets. All right, should we move on? Let me, uh, there you go. Okay, so um, the second point that we were thinking is kind of domain shift uh, when it comes to annotation. So uh, we've talked about batch effects in many different talks, and this is something we are all aware of. and beyond just batch effects when you're using, for example, even different technologies uh, or 
even you know, different labs and so on, um, the single cell RNA-seq data that you may get may not match another data set. And a lot of efforts of, uh, for example, these kind of uh, cell atlases goes into kind of integration and how to deal with this. Uh, but this can also become even a more, uh, a bigger problem when you're, for example, using single cell RNA-seq to annotate spatial transcriptomic data, again, of a very different type of technology, depending, of course, what you use. Um, so, and there has been a lot of great progress towards this. Uh, you know, we have methods that kind of as a pre-processing perform batch effect correction, but of course there's always the cha uh, challenge of too much correction so that you kill the signal. There are methods from the deep learning perspective, you have models that try to do automatically, for example, using domain adaptation and kind of adversarial type of training. Uh, but for those of you who have worked with those things, it always <laughs> feels a little bit like black magic, like it works when it works, but you can not easily make sure that it works and there's not easy way to assess how things work. Um, so basically the question here is that how can we address these issues uh, and what DL and ML models play this role and whether you have had any kind of experience with some deep, uh, deep learning models that um, trying to solve this problem and what, what has been your experiences. Anybody wants to? Have you guys faced this problem? Like when you kind of, how do you deal typically with kind of batch, or not even batch effect really, but kind of domain shift when you want to integrate that different data sets uh, together? Um, I think the, the batch effect is, probably a solvable question, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think what's harder is, well, there's also disease is, is an example of domain shift that is very relevant, even if we had perfect data. Um, and also development starts to get fuzzy and cancer gets fuzzy too. So some of these I think are more addressable than others. Uh, some source of domain shift for development, I don't really know what to do. That's, I think, probably in the developmental biologists world of what should we be calling this? How should we name this? And I think that disease versus healthy can be a little fuzzy too, especially in kidney. It's like, is that a healthy kidney or is it, you know, weeks away from having? Yeah, true. I mean, yeah, there is no single healthy right. uh, kidney, especially the samples that we get necessarily. Um, so, you know, also in the guy uh, maybe i think you're overthinking it it just um look if somebody's got good gfr and they weren't like in kidney you know problem space and just because they're old they're not in imminent danger of, of having kidney failure or there, there's you know underlying dysfunction that's just unmasked by the you know the the the, the donor associated metadata it's, no, it's but the but the cells look different than they do from a twelve year old's kidney. Well, that's a different problem. Okay, they look not, different from a, they look that. different from a age sex matched you know control from somebody else who has a different lifestyle. Then, and so I think the I, I agree that these cells are you know the T cells are still T cells or whatever, but if you are training a machine learning model and you put in healthy data. Uh, then you know you do have this domain shift when you're trying to annotate the Absolutely. new sample. Yes, one hundred percent right. Context is gigantic, and that has to be in the model. There's no question about that. You, you can get priors around that up the wazoo and any lineage you want to deal with. But um, but that you know not knowing if this is healthier disease when you have pretty good metadata around the sample that there's there's not that much lack of health in it. Yeah, my, I mean, my, yeah, my, yeah. the reason I brought that up is like, if you've labeled it as healthy and, and then you find out that actually that one wasn't healthy or whatever, or, you know, it's, it's hard to know necessarily if it's healthy or not at the time of, you know, taking the biopsy, perhaps it was healthy, but it may not, it may be on a trajectory toward unhealthy and I wouldn't and necessarily go there I'd go, go more to a model of like that there's there's um like heterogeneity in the sampling region that is like that might be associated with age and you can see things like you know like and then there might be 
you know, papers that say that, oh, look, there, there's, here's this 10% um, you know, glomerulosclerosis rate in people that are over 75. I don't know that that's true. I don't think it's true, but, but that you can see stuff like that. Um, that's a completely different factor, and that's approached by you know different sampling strategies, and there's other you know ways of you know kind of putting that into the context around you know, you know sample. But um, you know this the, the there has to be a way to do like the principal components of, of biological variation that's underlying like differences in very understandable um, cells. So you know let's say mast cells are almost unmistakable in almost any context. But guess what? There's there are differences by the, there's technology differences, there's um, and there's contact, you know, like tissue um, differences. And they're like, you know, kind of second order, third order components. And it's not that much of a drift in the, you know, like in the basic, if you did the DEG test in context for what's this um, in this sample, what do the mast cells look like? And then compared to the, you know, the best DEGs in another sample, it's not that much different, but you're talking about you know, sort of 20, 30% of the genes are shifted in, in significant ways. And that, you know, I think that's the kind of the, so we need a disciplined approach to like understanding the other associated sample attributes that are giving you context shifts and tissue of origins is huge on that. Thanks, just picking up on something that Bruce said. Um, I wonder if, um, which is that uh, the cell type is like a really strong signal if there's a discrete cell type. So you could, that's stronger than anything else. That's why the UMAPs work, right? That's why they match the clustering, which also picks up on the strongest signal. So can you use that to, um, you know, that strongest signal and kind of look at, uh, measure things in a relative way? Like it's the most, it's the closest to the canonical label as a way of, um, you know, addressing this problem because mm -hmm. presumably that strongest signal will be uh, not as shifted by the domain shift. I'll tell you my experience when, you know, you want to look at, for example, single cell versus spatial. The strongest signal was whether it's single cell or spatial, okay. right? Because you could get 100 percent <laughs> accuracy using just a simple random forest or support vector machine, just to differentiate between the two, as opposed to things being clustered together. You could see it in PCA, UMAP, everything. Um, and it's not always considered when you're using, for example, single cell data to annotate spatial data. And some methods have considered that, but a lot of methods also don't. Uh, so that was my personal experience. It may be different, maybe the data set, but that was my take on it. Good to know. Perhaps related to this point, um, I was just thinking about pathologists and when they you know, look at the tissue sections and can detect some of this irregularity of what the cell types looks in, look in tissue and whether some of that information of like pathology combined with spatial and RNA could help us to better understand whether the tissue is from disease or from healthy and feed into these models of, you know, kind of um, annotating the cells uh, in better way and kind of relates to this point of like transfer across different modalities, but you also using the, yeah, like H and E type of um, morphology. I guess more information, the better is the yeah. name of the game. Great point. Uh, so that's just the point I was yeah. like, We work very hard in the pre diagnosis, pre disease state, because we're interested in trying to find differences pre, pre detection, pre treatment. So the question then is really what you're using as your labeled reference has to have adequate longitudinal follow up, or, and then everything else can be potential for you to be able to say that this is clearly healthy or case or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, then the other interesting science can help that it's in the context of trying to identify those previous things. <coughs> Great point. Any more questions on this? Oh, yeah. There. Um, I also kind of just want to ask a bit. Um, so because if we're talking about the domain shifts, it, it is poses a problem. But I'm kind of wondering, <coughs> like, what what the questions we're trying to solve. So if we say, well, we want to be able to predict for a different data set in a slightly different domain, we want to predict cell types. 
um, and we find, okay, well, for existing methods that doesn't work well, uh, is the question like, do we want to predict these cell types perfectly or is it sufficient to say, well, they, it, it does work partially, but then we also expect it not to work and that could be new biology, which is something we want to resolve, but then the models still help us kind of do some, some of the tasks, so some of, some of the, um, or kind of, at least the model tells you how, how good like data map, how similar data are, so kind of already take that information out and then focus on the things that don't map because then that already kind of gives us a new focus, what to focus on, uh, yeah, new focus on things. I guess part of the question is how to tell whether something is biology and something is kind of the issue with the mm -hmm. distribution of the target not matching. I think that's the biggest challenge. I think yeah. if batch effects and biological effects are compounded, I think that's really hard because it's difficult to figure out. But if you find data that might not happen. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really strong point that you're making there, that they are compounded. And, um, that, and sometimes it's really interesting. So, that I'll, I'll just give you one little example. And, I mean, if you look really carefully and do DEG tests in this, this kind of co-clustered, totally harmonized um, cross technologies where you're doing like five prime um, 10x versus three prime 10x um, of cells versus new. Um, you'll see you get like, I don't know, 20, 30, 40%, depending on the cell type, more genes in one technology or another that are absolutely not measured in the other technology. And so um, if you can, are these, it's, it's a total artifact of the technology. But on the other hand, it's biologically very significant that there's a reason why some genes aren't very well measured in three prime, and um, or nuke seek and nuke seek seen some you know different things, and and it's all um, we don't want to throw things out. You want to get the right classifications that work across the technical spaces without you know, confounding and saying oh it's a different cell um, state. It's it's not necessarily at all. It's just you're just measuring different things about that that exact same cell state, and you know, and it's biologically interesting. Sure. Thank you. Sure. I I have nothing constructive to say. I just wanted to say that this should be extremely solvable, uh, irregardless of uh, regardless regardless of <laughs> words, of, uh, <laughs> of batch effects or disease or healthy or any of that. Uh, cause like, you know, going really simply, you know, 30 years or it's too long, maybe 15 years ago, looking the difference between a cat and a dog in different, uh, images, you, we can now very easily tell the difference between a cat, like algorithms can tell apart a cat or dog, regardless of <laughs> what the camera type was, if it's night out, if it's day out, if it's a cartoon picture of a dog they can figure all of that out. So that's why it's not constructive because I don't want to say how, but <laughs> it should be extremely solvable and not a problem because there's plenty of, you know, that's still a very high dimensional figure of, you know, hundreds of thousands of pixels, of many different RGB color states, et cetera. So it's, you know, so, and, and it's not just that, like they've also perturbed these images so that you can have a, the, a dog that looks like it was printed on metal or, you know, upside down cat or inverted, whatever. So it should be extremely solvable. So but, but sometimes it mistakes a loaf of bread for a cat. So <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not as much anymore. I like, think it's way easier to like humanly distinguish, but like cell types maybe not, right? Like, so that, that's one of the things that really benefits the kind of Models that you know, human can label, yeah, the ground truth. Oh, it's so. working or not. But when you have that kind of human adaptation type of things in the embedding, you look at a vector of embedding, okay, is it set up in the one or two? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really critical to make sure that if you're looking at different conditions, like you need a lot of batches for both conditions so that you can actually, like, if there are batch or technology effects they're not perfectly correlated with the biological condition. So like assuming you have enough batches, you start drowning out that signal and keeping that, that uh, biological signal. Yeah, great point. I guess the other interesting comparison to the imaging side is like in photography and image net, like the signal to noise ratio is almost 100%. But when you take a, a photograph of like this room, the fidelity is exceptional. Whereas, you know, just heard, you don't really have that with a lot of biological assays. So it's yeah. interesting to think like, 
do you need like an order of magnitude more data to start getting at these questions or do you need better measurement technologies or a range of technologies? I think it's, there's a lot there to unpack. And you can like separate um, color pictures where you have um, in one picture, you're um, filtering out all red and another picture you're filtering out all blue. And then could you do cross of the two images and predict what the actual image should be or something. Yeah, well, what's the equivalent in single cells? Interesting. Actually, they do do that though. Like they do take out a lot of the data to see if they can still identify the differences between cats and dogs. If they're still successful, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying, and you are right. Right? It is. A, it's a very different problem, but at the same time, it's very similar. Yeah. It should be. It should be. Yeah, should be. Exactly. <laughs> Well, you, I mean, there, there's also an equivalent set of augmentations you can do for, for single cell data, but I don't think they're already sort of applied as much. Um, should we have a slide on augmentations? We didn't put augmentations in here. Uh, Simulations. Simulations. Sorry? Simulations. Simulations. Uh, points. Yeah. yeah. Can, we can I get, talk about that, I guess, in the yeah. simulation side of things. Should we go to the third one? Yeah. And, any more discussion points on this, or we'll move to the next, which I think is granularity. Sort of related to this. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, this has come up multiple times in the conference so far, so uh, interested if there's more to add from this perspective. Um, but I think everybody knows, anyone who's ever dealt with single-cell data or annotated single-cell data knows there's a, a kind of unanswerable question of what's the granularity with which you'd like to annotate and understand the data. Um, and so our question here really, this is meant to be the deep learning mapping session. So our question is like, is there actually a role the methods can play themselves in, in deciding on what a useful, uh, I don't think there's any universal truth here, but is there like a useful uh, granularity of annotation we could establish. Um, you know, it does this vary depending on the data set, the analysis, the question I'm asking. Um, but fundamentally, are there are there methods we could actually bring to the game that would help help set this? Um, I'm, I'm hoping someone else can answer this because I don't think I have a good answer to it. I mean, there is no answer. That, that's for yeah. sure there is no answer. Yeah. But um, there's plenty of thoughts. Yes. Yes. I would have one thought. <laughs> so I, um, I think. Um, actually, I, I would say like all this, we're kind of also limited by what like ground truth is we have, right? We can't, it's difficult to go more granular than what we can go. Um, the other thing, it might also be a sampling um, problem, right? If you have smaller data sets and then there are some cell types that are just undersampled or not present, then of course you can't do a lot on that. But if you say increase the data set, set size, you might could hope that you get better resolution that we can actually increase in granularity. Um, I think. I don't know, I think granularity and like uh, model performance will probably kind of also depends on the data set size and the sampling, like what you sample in the end. So I don't think there's like an absolute number, it kind of depends on the factors, but maybe that's something to figure out. <laughs> I mean, you know that 20 years ago that um, they figured out how to do image reprocessing that could read license plates from satellites. And I mean, that was very hardcore um, you know, prediction of what the next pixel should be given a whole bunch of priors about. But you know, it's very green to begin with. So, so to say that there's no way to go beyond what you're seeing in this one particular instance of a you know noise pattern, that's probably the really I would say it depends on the current data you have, like the current data quality. If we say it maybe does not, it goes. You you can use priors to greatly augment, or, and, or at least the signal that's there in what you're looking at is more than you think. That's the basic. Idea. So are you saying even if the noise is not you, you would. <laughs> um, so I'm saying like like large uh, noise to signal ratio would not be a huge issue. I don't know. I'm sure it's an issue, that, but, 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 but I think there's ways of boosting that are not apparent, you know, that you could use. But I think um, that, that depends on models like, to, to do reprocessing. But I guess and that depends on a good ground truth that we are currently trying to build, I would say. So you always have to start in one end. Um, right. So how to, how to develop models that could, could overcome some of these noisy things. Question over there. Uh, I guess I think about it a little bit differently in that. Not that can we go beyond our current, uh, you know, the cutting edge of knowledge. I think you know that's a very tough problem, and I think machine learning doesn't even have a super great track record in that area. I mean, it's good, better than we expected. 
I mean, there's uh, but, there's thousands of articles every year that claim to be making a discovery. Well, they're what used. They machine learning is used in that at various parts, or whether that be image processing for you know, you know, astrophysics data or whatever. That's not necessarily saying that machine learning made the new discovery. I think to to classify a cell type that in higher resolution than you have training data for, that is a you know zero shot machine learning problem, which I think is sometimes <laughs> doable, but I think it's an incredible challenge. And, you know, usually right now for zero shot, we use other modalities to complement kind of what we expect to find, you know, so we would need to read text data to predict the existence of a cell that maybe is here, stuff like that. And I think that's an immense challenge. And I think more pragmatically, what we can do is if we can take away the difficulty of annotating single cell analysis, you know, up to a certain level, then the you know domain experts have a really good starting point. They can get up to speed on the data set in seconds rather than weeks, and then they can go and apply kind of their. You think? I do think. I don't yeah. know. I, I I don't know many domain experts that are, that can do that. I think if you can, the more data and the more kind of predictions that we can confidently kind of decorate our data set with, I think the easier it is to orient yourself. And so I guess what I'm saying is right, maybe seconds is a little bit generous, but I do think, you know, they can get up to speed quite rapidly because, you know, they do this for a living. I, I don't believe that's that. not what they do. They, they develop their domain expertise by, you know, looking at completely different um, Okay, I guess depending on what domain experts, but I, I mean, I do think that there are people with, you know, deep you know, immunology experience, you have some experience at looking at gene expression, who can, who can get that. I've got a question, yeah, yeah, question I from Gary here. To the very last point. Um, so, so now there, we're now seeing gene expression at a level of resolution that, that any expert who's like, you know, in the lab doing their own measurements has never seen this level of resolution of data before, never. And so now you're asking to match up extremely high resolution data that we have feature space that is going to like jive with their priors about you know what they think is the right marker set in this in this population. And mostly the stuff that they've trained on has to do with um, um, you know these surface markers that are way downstream you know at, at variable times after transcriptome A and then B. When you look at them, they're mostly crossing many subclasses that we see are, you know, very obviously distinct subclasses. Gary, sorry, I just wanted to um, ask if anyone knows. Just to come back to this this question, if anyone knows about the, if anyone uses persistent homology, does does anyone know that technique? It's from topology. It's um it's used to uh, look at information across scales and identify patterns that are stable um, uh, and then switch um, st to different different points so it can identify um, kind of stable uh, annot annotations or something at different scales um, and people use it for spatial analysis as well so check out persistent homology and the other um, it's been used in systems biology a few times um, by Trey Idaker and some other people. But um, another uh, idea that I've seen mentioned in the literature a little bit is space is multi-scale machine learning. There's a couple of reviews about it, but if you just search that, I don't, there's not that much about it, it seems. But, um, you know, we were, uh, some people are thinking about this. How do you uh, address multi multiple scales of granularity at the core of the machine learning method so that it can capture that information. And uh, it's a new area that maybe we should think about more. That's great. Thanks for the comment. We've got a, a question or a comment in the back. Yeah, uh, two things. Yeah, one comment is just an interesting example that most people probably know is like in C elegans, like every cell is given a unique name. So in terms of granularity, that's kind of the sort of existence of how low you can go. But yeah, another data point is I'm working with two large mouse brain data sets. And, I've, and I'm looking at how well the cell types replicate. And I see better replicability at the bottom of the sort of hierarchy at the lowest cluster level than at the sort of higher level where 
and annotators of maybe bigger groupings of cells. And yeah, so one one answer to this question is maybe that you know that the machine learning or deep learning deep learning methods they might help with that decision point whether to split or not split a pool of cells. So they might be more objective in deciding if this should be cut up smaller, as opposed to say a, a person looking at the data might have their favorite cell type, and they might you know have some sort of bias to see a split where a split might not exist. This reminds me, I don't know if you can see in here, but yeah, I've heard examples from like neuroanatomists where they're looking at the brain and they're looking at the cells and these stains and it's kind of like looking at a ceiling as told where the little dots would be like the cell nuclei. And at one point it's hard to draw the line between the two brain regions. And it sort of gets to the point where you're like looking at these tiles and being like, maybe the cell density is a little higher here versus here. So it's like, yeah, so that's sort of my perspective is maybe the machine learning, deep learning models could be more objective and saying whether to stop. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, that's that some, you know, there's in the, the that kind of a situation is typical of guess what? There's some feature that's driving this, you know, a, a slightly shifted geometry that is out of the measurement scale that you that you're not, it's not, you're not observing it. But on the other hand, this is a you know a secondary effect of it having been in there. And let's say, you know, it's it's a a difference in the dendritic arc, you know, spread pattern and you know, general shape. You know, there's presence of, of um, some cell type in that in this domain versus another that is like pushing things apart a little bit. I mean, those those are things that absolutely happen. And so so those are. I don't think you're grasping the straws when you, you know, have features that that say, hey, you know what, there's a transition there. Are right, we got a question over here, Greg. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a data visualization problem, really, because a lot of the, uh, it sounds like what people are talking about are in terms of the granularity of having to have one class, um, because you have this flat 2D scatter plot of view maps or whatever, and you can only give them one color or something along these lines. Um, and maybe that's just a data visualization issue, and you can show, I'm biased because I made one of these, so that's not really fair, but if you just show all the resolutions all at once, then it's probably less of an issue. Uh, yeah, that's all. So to me, it sounds more like a visualization issue than a, than a classification issue. Great question here. But I think there's also a case where going at a too much high resolution can lead to like waste of, like essentially, you know, you can always find the nearest neighbors of every cell. But uh, if the purpose is like isolating a certain cell type, maybe like say this could be you know a target for therapy or something like that. I think it matters to find groups that are like you know you could go at the highest possible resolution and just look at the nearest neighbors for each cell. But you this um, doesn't necessarily mean that this type of cell state is replicable across across conditions or that you can isolate it. So I think it depends like basically what you want to do with. The labels and maybe not going at the highest resolution sometimes is like not a great idea. It can lead to like spend a lot of time to try to validate a cell state or replicate a cell state that actually is not you know consistently found. What did you say but about isn't isn't the highest it, resolution simply different cells? Yes, in some ways, right? I mean, it, but in a way, it. you I wouldn't call a difference like. Um, the, the beauty about the C. elegans example is that you can find the same cell in every C. elegans. So, like the information about finding a set a single cell that is like interesting in a single individual, you can't do much with that information, right? Um, it's not. I don't know what what it, what do you use it for? But if you show them all the resolutions at the same time, you can see the granularity that you want that has the most mixing between different individuals with it, you how know, you, how do you and not too far. Like, how do you make how, how do you make that decision? Like, hmm. just the best I, mean, I don't want to I don't want to advertise my thing, but there there are ways to do it, right? You should like, Google might find it useful. All right, fine. There's this great tool called Too Many Cells, and it can do that. Um, but yeah, but basically, uh, using like a dendrogram type of uh, visualization, right? That's kind of what you're seeing is you can have single cells all the way at the bottom. You can have the higher resolution of which of those you know are grouped together based off of some kind of cutting point, and then keep going up. Our ours goes top down, but 
either way, it's the same kind of idea where you can have, oh, this resolution at this level has a lot of mixing between samples, but when you go down too far, you have different samples being split out. So we want we don't want to go down that far, but this resolution is what we'd be interested in. Right? There is an automatic or like a metric uh, statistic that you can use to yes, measure exactly. it. And this I think is very powerful. It, like frequency, this consistency or robustness is super ignored in the area. Like at some point, like if you go super, super granular, right? At some point, would you just end up with noise, like more noise? Or, I don't know, it's just too messy and not informative. So I think that's what we're trying to find the point where we get more signal and then. So that, that's why you can visualize it though. So you can yeah, see yeah, where it starts to yeah. Uh, how do you decide uh, where the noise is going to match it? Um, so we use Newman Gurban modularity, uh, but I'm sure there's many other ways as well. I'm sorry, what is that that you use? Uh, uh, it's it, network modularity. It's like Q or like Luzain clustering and, and things like that. So, yeah. All right, question in the back. I just want to mention another scenario where. Uh, Oh, uh, where uh, very high resolution clustering can then be problematic is, uh, for example, for um, the cell type the convolution in like spatial transcriptomics that is not single cell. So that probably has to do with the limitation of the convolution methods as well. But in those cases, when you try to essentially replicate, uh, you know, do cell type uh, estimation in response from these using very high resolution uh, clusters. Um, is you know you have a lot of conflicts and a lot of like unreliable labeling and so um, I yeah I, I I don't know if people have experience with this or like what again there it, it, you probably there's not one size fits all resolution and uh, you know having essentially various level of granularity can help in using the same data for multiple problems and also extends to bulk the convolution I think the same problem. Yeah, it would be so useful to have a method that lets you understand what the maximum granularity you can go to for these deconvolution methods is and still trust the trust the resulting deconvolution. All right, should we I think we've got like five, ten minutes left. We can go to the next question. So um the other question is about overfitting. Um should we uh, in the interest of time, should we read the next three questions and then let people choose whichever they want to talk about? Yeah, we can should, should we go back to the initial yeah, the, the overview well, slide. It has a little bit of mixed information. You can just read it. So uh, one, the second, the fourth question is focused on overfitting. Basically, uh, deep learning cell type mapping may be prone to overfit, which is of special concern across technologies and batches. Uh, and I guess one question is how do we uh, address this problem when we're talking about kind of supervised uh, cell annotation approaches. So that's one question. Um, you want to mention this as well? Then. Oh, yeah, sure. The next question, which I would love to know the answer to is, uh, you know, how do we measure the performance of unsupervised analysis? Again, this is a really underdefined question and, and problem, but, you know, we've all been there. There's a, a million algorithms for clustering and visualization, um, and there's not really a grand truth of, you know, there is no such thing as perfect clusters, right? Um, and so are there new tools or data required to, to help uh, establish what a quantitative way of comparing unsupervised analysis is? Um, does this even matter or is a good enough clustering or dimensionality reduction good enough? Is, is I think it also relates to the granularity idea we were discussing because if, for example, clustering of single cells are used to then define then you want to annotate the cell types again goes back to what is a good clustering how um, you know refined it needs to be and so on and the last question that is a little bit different uh, but i think it was related to some of the data augmentation or other aspects of it is the role that simulation can play in this domain um, especially i think maybe one aspect of it is for model development as kind of having the ability to have ground truth, but of course there are the data augmentation aspect and various other ones. So basically the idea is that there have been recently several uh, simulators of sing single cell RNA-seq data using different approaches. For example, generative adversarial networks is a common one that has been um, used and with different properties. Some of them allow you to, for example, take advantage of different cell types or clusters, 
that you have some models uh, allow you to import certain causal graph or gene regulatory network in this simulated data while still trying to match distribution of the simulated data to real data. Um, and other applications like, for example, gene knockout prediction and so on has been used for that. So what roles do you think um, kind of realistic simulators play, uh, particularly in the context of you know, research in this domain or HCA and whether there are aspects that, that can be addressed through this uh, domain? So these are some of the questions. That, so if any of them you have any comments, so you know, for all any of these three questions, or or anything else, or anything else. Yeah. And there's only five minutes left. So if you want to say something really controversial, now is a good time because no one can argue back. <laughs> uh, do you want to start it back? Yeah, on the topic of like simulations, I've worked on, like recently on the problem of like identifying cell states that are not found in a reference, uh, like disease associated cell states, and also for other. Uh, you know, project where we were interested in using comparative methods and finding differences between data sets. In my hands, like the simulation software that exists, like Splatter or like more advanced uh, uh, sort of variations from Splatter, are very useful for like early development, but they don't really represent the data very well. And what we've actually, what I've actually used a lot is actually some sort of semi semi synthetic approach where you take real data and maybe you simulate an aspect which usually means cell labels, for example. So for example, if we want to identify disease-associated states, we take a data set where we don't expect to have any disease-associated states, split it at random, and then take out some part of the data set in one of the two, you know, in what we consider. And with that, that uh, type of method that uses real gene expression data, but maybe simulated labels or simulated splitting, like split simulating samples, essentially, I think is like, it's, it's a better sanity check than yeah, I think you brought up a very interesting point because when you talk about simulated and synthetic data, you can have methods that are rule based and they just start from scratch and they said this is the rule. I simulate data based on these rules. Those, you know, they don't have a reference of, for example, real data to have a comparison, but also there are you know, more newer methods that definitely have a data set of single cell data and they try to take advantage of that uh, one way or another. For some of them, for example, just generate the whole gene expression profile while trying to use kind of an adversarial like GANs and similar to what we have in other domains, try to like make profiles that are indistinguishable uh, by a very strong, for example, classifier, whether it's synthetic or realistic. I mean, there's a bit of a catch-22, right? That if, if you make a new computation model, it should be the best representation of the world that you, you think it is. So therefore, the rational thing to do is simulate from your model. But then, of course, your model is going to be the best at recapitulating what you just simulated. So it's it's hard to get that sort of... But I, I like the idea of using uh, using real data to, to work on it. Uh, I think I heard Gary's first. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So I mean, just... This may sound terribly naive, but if you can solve uh, six, discussion point six, points one and five just fall in line in terms of their solvability. I guess it depends how faithful your simulator is, right? So if you can, I mean, they, but there was effort spent on creating or, develop, or defining how realistic a simulator is. Yeah. But uh, a lot of our simulators. You know, we don't know how the simulator generated the data. It's a complicated black box kind of function that generated that. It works well, it doesn't, it could, it does, or sometimes doesn't. Sure. I think I would say, I mean, simulations, I want to see them as a tool, right? They can be very useful and they, they're very diverse. So, like, I think they can be very helpful if you say you want to look at one specific aspect doesn't have to be super realistic depending on what, what you're looking at um and i guess you can yeah use like multiple different settings and then try to see what happens um and of course not relying on one single simulation to say this is what i used to validate but i guess it could be helpful to just understand a little bit maybe maybe what the model biases are or something if you have like an educated guess on maybe it might be biasing this you can just simulate a strong effect and see uh, that would be my intuition like i have really Good point. Gary? Just wanted to mention a quick point. Um, we use a simulator called Sergio, which is a biophysics based uh, no, simulator that starts with a gene regulatory network. So it's a full, fully you know, visible or model. 
but it's useful for when we're interested in interpreting the deep learning model, we can have a ground truth of master regulators or something that we're trying to use to, or trying to identify from the model. We, we know that they, that's what generated the data. So there is, I guess, a complementary type of simulator that it's, it's not as, doesn't faithfully represent the data, but it does generate reasonable. So on that end, there is another work that we're working on, which is, again, you can impose the GRN, it uses kind of causal uh, GANs in order to generate the data, cool. which is kind of motivated by the same. Okay, way. I'd love to find that over yeah. yeah. Thoughts or comments on any of the questions? Maybe one other point we, we, we did um, have a, might be out a preprint uh, that um, found that using adversarial training mm -hmm. improves the um, the generalization, generalizability and interpretability of, of some of these models like cell, cell type classification. So I don't know if anyone here has been trying to play with adversarial training, but we found it was quite useful for- Adversarial to match um, the assets. The adversarial training approach um, it augments the training data set with um, out of distribution data that's generated from the model that's learned on some base data in a way that interferes, is meant to interfere with the learning and then retrain so that you kind of, um, you uh, train, you, your model is robust against adversarial attack mm -hmm. and um, and then the resulting model is better, it's supposed to be better, but more generalizable than it typically is. But we also found it's more interpretable and has, gives better results on cell type classification. So that's great. Look forward to reading the preprint. Is, is it up or is it going? Yeah, up? I think so. Okay, awesome. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, probably a good time to, to wrap up. All right. Well, thank you so much for everyone sharing your thoughts. Yeah, this, this is recorded. There should be notes as well. So, um, but yeah, see you everyone.